So um, we're going to talk a little bit about securing the cloud, right? Um, and, uh, and and really just I'd say DNS security in general. Um, and so uh, I'm going to present with uh, my friend Chris Riviere from uh, Cisco, uh, who's here with us today. Uh, he actually works on Cisco's umbrella team, uh, and I believe you're a con senior consultant, technical solutions, technical solutions yeah. architect. Okay. So so yes, yeah, so we'll go ahead and go through. <clears throat> so. Um, you know, DNS has been relevant for a really long time to cloud security. Uh, on the Packet Pushers Network, I was just listening to one of the Day 2 Cloud podcasts where they were talking about the visibility. You know, there's so much that's encrypted now, uh, but DNS is typically a protocol that you can use to actually get some, tel like, telemetry, not the telemetry SNMP replacement, but telemetry about what's going on in an environment. Uh, and, and we certainly believe that, um, you know, the ability to apply, provide visibility into uh, DNS queries, uh, what they're doing, can show the intent of a device at a given point in time. Uh, and the ability to set policy against DNS queries gives you an, a, a modicum of control against what your endpoints are doing, right? So whether it's, um, you know, uh, an end user trying to go to Facebook or uh, you know, a, a, a user, a business user trying to connect to a finance system or what have you, typically any kind of transaction like that is initiated with a DNS query. That's the first thing that happens. And if you're able to control what happens to that query, you can control and, and protect in some cases that user uh, by applying policy to that. Um, and then, you know, of course, DNS can be used for things like DNS exfiltration, malware, things of that nature. So the ability to do detection of things that are either malicious or anomalous or what have you can all be done by examining and really taking a look at DNS queries. Uh, Blue Cat has a product called we call DNS Edge, and uh, it is a uh, cloud-managed, again, policy-driven, we were just talking about policy, uh, uh, solution, and it's essentially a DNS server that sits at what we'll call the first hop for a user from a DNS perspective. So first hop, so the first DNS server that you are querying, it's going to one of our DNS servers. That DNS server has the ability to monitor and provide visibility to every single query across your environment. Uh, it has the ability to um, uh, essentially apply policy, uh, and it also has the ability to uh, do what we'll call internet breakout. So you can choose to uh, break out the DNS traffic to multiple sources of truth. So if you have an environment like a cloud environment where you may need to do DNS resolution locally, or you may need to do it in a shared VPC, or you may need to do it on premises, you have the capability to, if you get an NX domain, which is uh, basically, uh, you're not going to respond to that query. If you get an NX domain from an individual DNS server, you can try other DNS servers that may be able to provide you with an answer. Uh, and we call those uh, namespaces or intelligent networking from the perspective of DNS. It's a, it's a bit of a messy name because of, you know we don't want to say routing because that's confusing for our customers. Uh, but we were able to do that. And so by examining all these and sitting at this first hop, we're able to actually see all of the traffic that's going out to potentially an outbound recursive server, and we can apply policy right away at that first hop. Um, so customers, are, sorry, give me just one second, apologize. So, you know, enforcing policy. So what can policies do from a DNS perspective? So. You know, obviously, it's the, it's very similar to what you'd see in a lot of other environments. We have the ability to block something. We could just monitor it, uh, or we could do a DNS redirection where we're responding with a different IP address, directing someone to a, you know a captive portal of some kind that's letting them know that they're they're breaking policy, things like that. Um, we're able to detect things uh, based on domain lists that we manually define. Uh, we can do that based on specific types of queries. As an example, uh, if you think about like an MX query, which is a, a common DNS query, you should never see an MX query from an end user. It should only ever be from a mail server. So if you see an end user doing a query like that, you would want to block that, not allow it, or at least alert on it so that you can go take some action. Uh, and I would even say, you know, in most environments, if you're seeing internal servers or internal queries in your internal on-premises environment where you're seeing server fails or NX domains, that's almost always an indication of some kind of a misconfiguration somewhere that you need to go and investigate. Um, we can also detect things like tunneling and domain generation algorithms. And actually, with our partnership with Cisco Umbrella, they also were able to do that, of course. Uh, we can do it at the first hop. They can do it for anything that's going north-south uh, and provide just an excellent amount of data around that. Uh, we can do it based on source IP address or destination IP address. So again, a lot of the same things that we're able to do in some other you know, firewalls, things like that, we can do it at the DNS layer, which again will prevent any of that follow-on conversation <coughs> happening 
because if you get an NX domain, you're not going anywhere. And now, you know, some of your other security devices can flex their muscles on, the, on some of the real problems that are not known threats. Um, and a lot, of doing, a lot of doing this will complement things like network segmentation, micro segmentation, because you can kind of lock this down to very specific uh, you know, east-west internal traffic uh, that we can, that we can uh, enforce. Um, in a traditional DNS environment, and, and this kind of goes back to the uh, DNS traffic routing that we were talking about before, a lot of times you'll have only maybe one or two outbound recursive servers that are sending out traffic to the internet for a resolution either via root hints or something like Google or OpenDNS. Um, but in uh, a DNS Blue Cat environment, we have the capability, <coughs> and actually, the, so, so you know, when you, let me step back for a second. So you, there are services such as Office 365 that have POPs all around the world. When you have an end user going to Office 365, you don't want them, if they're in Southern California or Northern California, to go to the POP somewhere around the world. You want them to go to the one that's local to them so they get localized content and they get rapid speed. There's, you know, there are performance uh, things in, in, that are involved there. And so you want them to be able to do that. So within a Blue Cat environment, um, we have the capability to define specific rules on our DNS servers, which mean that for specific sites that are, we'll call them trusted SaaS services like Salesforce.com, Dropbox, Office 365, et cetera, et cetera, um, you have the capability to go for those direct to the internet. So if the user is trying to go to Office 365, instead of having to do resolution back to the central data center where you have uh, you know, you're going across maybe expensive lease lines and then you're going to get a DNS record that's associated with the local uh, you know, outbound recursive server there at that expensive data center. So if you're in Asia Pack, you want to get the Asia Pack version of something. So you can do that by going direct to the internet. And it's just like, you know, supporting, uh, kind of supporting what we're doing with SD-WAN today, where you're doing kind of an internet breakout, but from a DNS perspective, so you're getting that local record. Uh, and we can do that with our DNS servers. Uh, and you can kind of see uh, that here as well. So we're reducing the complexity because we'll have what is called a namespace associated with the specific uh, SaaS services that you are using as part of your business. Uh, and you can have some of the traffic will be internal. You'll direct that internally. And then you will have your public records would go out through maybe your external recursive servers or, in this case, out to uh, Cisco Umbrella. So we have the capability to do that as well. So explain this to me for just a little bit more. Um, sure, absolutely. Um, I'm just trying to think about the logistics of making this happen through DNS. So you mentioned like, you know, we do this through SD-WAN and we do a local breakout. And so you're going to do a local DNS record. Mm -hmm. What happens if you want to shove that across your WAN? Are you then going to take what the, what the public record is and make it an internal record to make sure that it ends up there and then sure. translate it? Like, I mean, like, how are you? Sure, sure, sure. So um, typically what, what a customer will do is on, so, so all this is cloud managed from a central location, very similar to like an SD-WAN solution. So they'll define all their internal <laughs> zones. Their internal zones are defined. So those would be zones that would be resolved by your internal DNS servers, your on-premises DNS servers. Yep. You'll define your list of SaaS applications that you're using. And any time that you're trying to query one of those, it would go direct out to the local internet breakout. And that could maybe use, could use Cisco Umbrella, it could use Google, it could use one of the other many local DNS providers that's providing a global anycasted IP address. I'm just trying to figure out in a situation in which that wouldn't happen regardless of which DNS server you're having. Oh, the idea is if you have local internet breakout locally, sure, absolutely. when you resolve that address, even if you're not using this, you're going to get a public address. It should go right out the internet circuit. It's like right, across but, your WAN. But with a lot of large enterprises, in, in, uh, traditionally what they'll do is they'll actually have a forwarding state statement that goes to some data center for resolution. So instead of having it go to that central data center for resolution where, again, maybe your user is in the UK and their central data center is in Boston. You're going to do some centralized DNS server. Exactly. The, the resolution is going to happen exactly. you know, maybe a few hundred miles away. We're going to really more of like a branch model rather than a centralized data center model. So you can make that the DNS decision at the branch. And again, you can push it out in a global way through a cloud interface. So what we're going to show you is um, we're going to show you a, um, give me just one second here. We're going to create a DNS tunnel with iodine. So if you guys have ever used that before, uh, the iodine, uh, iodine is a, as a tool to do DNS tunneling, and it will try different methods of doing that. Uh, and then I will, I'll show you the uh, DNS Edge user interface uh, and how we can stop that. And then we'll, we'll show a couple other things in DNS Edge as well. So. Um, I'm going to initially just create the. Oh, give me one second here.
So I'm establishing the tunnel. When I do that, you can see I can do an IF config. And you'll see that I now have an interface specific to that tunnel. I promise you I just made that. I was going to show you before, but I believe you guys will trust me. So now I'm going to do SFTP to a server. So this, this particular client is sitting, uh, is connect, making a connection to an Amazon server. Let me just make sure the tunnel is up. Okay. So, and I'm going to put a file called, let me do this. Put, Okay, so I'm going to put a file. It's about a 56 meg file, and I think the MTU for the tunnel is about 400k. So it'll take a little bit of time. So we'll pop over to the umbrella user interface, or sorry, the uh, edge user interface. Apologies. So this is our, our DNS edge user interface, and um, what I'm actually able to see right here is all of the different queries uh, that are going. If I were to clear out this particular site, this is actually uh, live on Blue Cat's corporate network, uh, and this is uh, used by really all the developers at BlueCat for um, automation testing, for uh, you know anything like that. And I have the capability to filter on uh, various, um, let's say, sites which are collections of DNS servers. I can filter by query name, query type. If I wanted to see, as an example, all of the MX records that are, that are being sent, I could do that uh, just by filtering like this. And you can see that a lot of them are you know, being blocked here. Okay? I can do all kinds of queries. So if I were to filter on the site, where those queries that the DNS tunneling is using are going against, you can see, or maybe you haven't seen it, you can't see it yet, but we should be able to see soon, uh, that you can see that the, it's installed. Give me one sec here. Make sure that the policies, this is what happens when you're, you're uh, let's see. Oh, there we go. So it's going now, so let's go see if we can see it. There we go. We can start to see some of this. So this is essentially the tunnel right now is using what are called uncommon records, so different types of uncommon DNS types uh, to transmit the data. And if I click on that, I can see the actual query name is being used. Uh, and so it's being picked up right now. There's a couple different indicators that we're seeing. We're seeing that it's using an uncommon record, lots of unique characters in uh, the uh, FQDN. Uh, the host size is very large, and it looks like volumetric tunneling. But I don't have any policy right now to block that. So what I can do is go over to my policies and scroll down, and I can look at this query types policy. So this policy, when active, will block all of these different query types, which are very uncommon, obsolete, what have you. But the reality is, if you look at any network today, you will see these on these networks, and there is absolutely no reason for them today. So if I were to edit this, turn it to active, save and apply, I can go back over here, and what we'll see is this will stall, and it will eventually stop. And you can see it's stalling now. It's going to the bandwidth is going to go go down. So what I would do then is, if I'm a if I'm a malicious actor, I'll just run iodine, iodine, iodine again. Sorry, I can talk. I promise. Uh, I'll run iodine again, and what it'll do is it will reestablish a connection, and it will use some other methodology to do that. Uh, most of the time, what we see it do next is use text records to uh, to go out. And actually, I believe it actually says that here uh, in one of the. Let's see if we can find it here. It looks like it's looking for one. It's getting NX domains for different types of things, and it'll keep trying until it finds a way to send traffic out. It'll use all the variable, all the combinations. Exactly. And you're basically attempting to block all of the ones that it would use. Exactly. For exfiltration, yeah. Right, and so it's gonna go through the different uncommon query types, and then when it finds out that it can't do that, it'll eventually settle on using text records. Yep. <clears throat> and, wait. While, while we're waiting for that, um, I, you know, I should show you, you know, we have a lot of different insight that customers can leverage uh, in terms of you know, the data that we can get from DNS. And Patricia showed you some of that earlier with the roundels that have the you know, different connections. Yeah. But we can start to see you know, what are the threat indicators on my network? What types of queries am I seeing? You know, what, you know, and you can drill down into every single one of these to see more detail. Like I said. So this is a dashboard that you'd give away to the security team to say, his known security functions that Blue Cat's handling. Absolutely. But don't yeah. necessarily give them administration rights to the 
Exactly, and and every uh, every policy that we create, when things match policy, they can be exported to a sim, so the security team can kind of consume it in the way that they're used to consuming security data, which makes them happy. Yep. Um, and let's see if we got our. Oh, that makes me sad. There we go. So it's going to use text queries now. So now if we go back, so just for everyone, I <coughs> saw it right there. Okay. And if we go back over here, we'll see that. It should pick back up in a second here. <coughs> Wake up. Yeah, <laughs> it's very exciting. Yes. No problem. So um, when that happens, what we would be able to do, and I'll get ready for it now, is go over to a specific policy now this policy is not going to look for query types. It's going to look specifically for DJ and tunneling, yeah. um, which it's using different kinds of entropy to, to see that. And it looks like we're picking back up right now. It's still labeled as stalled, but it appears to be transmitting data. Yeah. So if I were to edit this, turn this on, save and apply, it's gonna block that as well. And now we can go back to the query log and we'll specifically start to see things that are blocked that are text records. And I did some this morning, so I'm gonna see if I can just do a query type of TXT in the interest of time. And you can see, so there are the traffic. Let me see if I can see the plus policy action block. And you can see that it was blocked earlier today. Sa yep. Same exact thing to tube.com. So it you know works quite well for that as a security tool, uh, and and you know can be very useful. I have a question for you. Of course. Um, so I, this is what I've seen so far. Is I've seen a, a pretty good implementation of a DNS server, and, and you know like what I think what we'd expect from this kind of space in the market. Sure. What's your differentiator? What's the thing that puts you out ahead of you know your competition? What's the thing that you do better than everybody else? Sure, absolutely. So uh, I think you know Blue Cat is absolutely committed to the way networks are changing today. Uh, and what I mean by that is, you know, obviously like uh, customers are moving into the cloud as rapidly as possible. Uh, it's it's a fact of life, and we need to make it easier for them to do that. Um, the other thing is, um, and I think there's a little bit of the workforce catching up with the need for people who can code in addition to understand how networks work and how systems work. But as we're seeing that catch up and we're also seeing some of the tools catch up, you know, everything's becoming API based and we need to be part of that as well uh, to make this. So, you know, in the past I would say, uh, and I've gone to large financial organizations where they said, oh yeah, we're really good at this, 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 and this. But when we go to deploy a DNS record, it takes us a week and there's a process that involves, you know, a bunch of different products and, and service now and, you know, all these different things. It can't be a speed bump anymore. It has to work at the speed of business. And you kind of saw that with the cloud implementation, which is as fast as you can spin up an EC2, I need to be able to add that to DNS so that you can start working immediately. Uh, and we're absolutely committed to that. I think the other thing, um, and this is, I, in my experience, I've been at Blue Cat for four and a half years. The thing that I think customers forget about the most is the migration. Uh, there's no greenfield in a DNS from a DNS perspective, right? Everyone has Windows servers, bind servers, you know, a solution doing DNS and DHCP. And you know, I equate it to like swapping out the floor of your house without moving your house or any of your furniture. It's very similar to that because of you, it has to be yeah. perfect and it has to work because the, you know, if DNS is out, a lot of the business is down. And so it's, it's really critical that we have that. So um, that's, I would say our two biggest is our focus on you know the ability to, for customers to automate, the ability to move faster, uh, and then also our ability to migrate data, okay. migrate data, and also implement the system as well, right? With with zero downtime. As a matter of fact, um, you know Patricia was mentioning a really large financial organization uh, that is a customer of ours, and the thing that they said that was maybe one of the best compliments I've heard from a customer is, during the migration, no one knew it was happening, and I you know that that's I think the bar right for for how to do that. So, so let me go back in here. So, um, you know, Blue Cat is a DNS company. Uh, that's our core competency. That's what we pride ourselves on. And certainly we have to offer security features within our product. It has to be secure by default. It has to be role-based access control. There's all the things that you <coughs> must have, right? Um, but we're not anywhere near a, a security company and we don't have the kind of intelligence that some of our, that, that some of our you know, other companies in the industry have but most specifically Cisco, right? Um, the threat intelligence that Cisco Umbrella has is there is nothing better in the industry for that. Uh, and uh, we knew that partnering with them would be the right thing to do for our customers to kind of help out with 
you know, that aspect of it, right? So we can do great things with policy, either north, south, or east, west, but we didn't have a really a good threat intelligence story. And Cisco has, again, the best, and they do a lot of other things as well. Uh, and we've got a lot of customers who are huge Cisco shops and, and really very happy uh, and kind of asked us, hey, why can't you guys do something with Umbrella? So we did. And you know, if you, if you look at the diagram we have up here, and I'll, I'll, I won't spend too much longer on this because I'm going to give Chris some time, but we have the ability kind of, again, we're that first top DNS server. So we have the ability to, if we know that the traffic is going external, to just route it directly to Umbrella's global anycasted IP addresses, which means that a, you're going to get a lot of that local service automatically because that's something that Umbrella offers. Uh, and B, you're going to get, again, the best DNS threat intelligence as well as some other things in the industry. So, so I'm wait a second. Um, uh, that's, I'm not a networking guy like all the storage guys like to say. <laughs> I, I don't understand I like how you, I like you disassociate that. yourself every I, time. I, 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 absolutely. <laughs> I am so, not that. Oh, my. No, no, no. There's a lot no, of no, things no. going on. There's a lot of uh, small oh, sure. white text you've been showing. What's what's going on here? Well, I mean, sure. Is, there's a DNS request going on. Is, are you routing that to the Cisco umbrella thing to show if it's malicious first? Y and yeah. then if you see it's not malicious, are you sending and back processing it? Uh, so so yeah. So let me let, let me kind of speak to that real quick. And uh, Chris, feel 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 free to add in anything you want. So. Um, and again, this, this slide is we're trying to, in the interest of time, kind of consolidate everything down to a simple view. But you have some clients here that need to either resolve things that are on-premises for internal apps and services through internal DNS, or they need to potentially go out to the internet for something. Okay, And there's lots of other paths DNS could take as well, but for, for the sake of this slide. So the client makes a DNS request, which comes to our DNS server. At that point, we make a determination. Is this internal? If it is, we so when send you it say, Sorry to interrupt. When you say a client, is it an, a, a client which resides in your own network? Is it an yes, it's an, it, it, yes, it's an, okay. on, it's an enterprise client of some kind. And okay. again, it could be an end user, a server, an IoT device, anything that is on-premises that is in, within your control. Okay. Okay? So... Um, and, and actually, I should take that back. It could be a cloud client as well, right? There's no reason not to, you know, not, you wouldn't be able to do that. So if that DNS query needs to be routed to a local DNS server, on, which is, again, either on-premises, in the cloud, et cetera, we're able to do that. But if we see that this is an external domain, it's a, not a domain that we control, it's not part of our, uh, our organization, we can send it directly to Umbrella. And by doing that, then Umbrella is able to get the actual source IP of the client which solves a problem for Umbrella users, right? They want to be able to do user attribution to who is this person who is sending this, so that if it is some kind of malware or something malicious, they have the capability to identify that, and then the user can go take action, or the, sorry, the administrators can go take action, the security team. So are you uh, implying here that Umbrella is checking if the client is legit on the network, if they have the rights to do that, or? Uh, from a DNS perspective, absolutely, okay. yes, yes. So you can have different policies associated with different groups of users uh, within your environment. And if a user is trying to do so, as an example, if you wanted to block all access to gambling sites internally on the, you know, in your work environment, uh, you might do that. And you could specifically segregate your users here so that if a user tries to go to a gambling site, again, it's an external site, so it's going to be routed to Umbrella. So you can um, set the policy, for example, which blocks access to gambling sites to everyone except the CEO, for example. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Cool. Yes. Which <laughs> happens often for some yeah. weird reason. I'm not really sure why. Yeah. Weird, um, right? Yeah. Can I but ask you? Of course. I'm not a networking guy. But <laughs> <laughs> okay. You guys are playing. You guys are playing a joke on me at this point. <laughs> but by, no. So. No, the, the, no. The problem is so everything is managed with a single interface. I mean, you manage also umbrella, right? Because. The, the end different interfaces. The, secure, the, the customer's security team or administrative team or what have you, they're responsible for admin, administering the policy within Umbrella that gets applied to the users which are consuming DNS. And the Umbrella policy can only be effective if we have the traffic coming to us. So essentially the integration allows Blue Cat to very easily send all the external queries. So you know, Facebook.com, et cetera. Make sure that those queries go to us. <coughs> but more importantly, sends the additional bit of information about who's requesting that website. Because lots of times the problem is, if we have this whole hotel, <coughs> let's say the hotel points all their DNS to us from an external perspective, someone's going to a really bad site, the next question is, who's going to the bad site? And typically what you'll have if you just have all your DNS uh, I'm, I'm missing, so is this integration totally transparent to the user, or the user has to know and manage two different <coughs> platforms to make it? Oh, so sure, that's a great question. So. The again, we're we're playing so Blue Cat and is playing to our strengths, right? Which is the 
on premises, and when I say on premises, it could be within a cloud, right? But DNS environment, okay? Cisco is the best in the industry at security, and so by, by handing to them the DNS query that's going external and allowing them to do what they do, which Chris is gonna spend some time talking to you guys about how that works and what they're able to do, um, they're able to do that. The, I will tell you, the Cisco <coughs> umbrella interface is probably one of the easiest I've ever seen in terms of setting up a very complicated security policy and posture, uh, and, and yet at the same, it's, it's easy to use, and yet pretty darn granular. I was actually really surprised. Um, and no, you know, no offense. Typically, like a blue, someone administering the, correct me if I'm wrong, the blue cat isn't going to be setting content policies about who can access Exactly. It. That's going to be the security yeah. team. Exactly. Someone who manages the endpoints, right? Someone who's responsible for that. Exactly. Be someone who's managing the DNS infrastructure. Yeah. So you talk about a partnership, but you know, to me, this really seems like just an upstream DNS server that you, you know. That so the, 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 the bit is that they're, the tiny bit that's missing from what you just said is passing on, they're leveraging DNS extensions to pass on with that DNS query to us to pass on the private IP address of so who's making that query. Yeah, and we also create an that's, API, that's we, we also that's create an special. API relationship with Umbrella where we get identified as a network device uh, within Umbrella's interface. So there's actually an API relationship as well between us as well. And there's, we have a bunch of plans for the future in terms of what we're gonna do with them. Uh, we're, this is just us getting started and what we're providing to them today is IP address, but there are a lot of other things that we're planning to leverage. We can take advantage of their ecosystem. They can take advantage of the information that we have, and it's it's all to the gain for the customer. That's that's what's important. And so for now, the only the only thing you're partnering on, quote unquote, is the the source IP address that you pass on. That's right. So what are the future plans for that? So future plans would include uh, identifying the actual end user, right? So we, you know you're logged in via Active Directory or LDAP or what have you. Passing on the end user would be important. Uh, Cisco umbrella passing back to DNS Edge. What is the what, why was this block? What's the posture of this device? Um, there's there's other things as well. So that's I mean and, and uh, um, again Cisco has a very rich ecosystem from a security perspective. And if you're familiar with that, you can kind of imagine some of the things we might be able to do. And and <laughs> yeah, what that, protocol is this all going over between the Blue Cat and Cisco umbrella? It's DNS. It's but DNS. You want with all this going over UDP DNS over the internet? Yes. You're kidding me, right? No. What? Is there anyone in the room who does security? You really want this stuff going over the internet unsecured? That's actually one. You of want the usernames of yeah. and all this stuff and all the audit information going unsecured over the internet? There's no My user security team no throw you out on your ear in a heartbeat. It's not different than an than a oh my than God. It's not different. There's no usernames. You just said. You just said well, right, right. that was what where you wanted to go. No, no, no. no, was, no you no, wanted no, to identify right, usernames. So, you so, wanted to have so all Cisco the reasons uses why DNS crypt and, and so what they were doing. All passed so back we support, from. We support um, DNS crypt, and one of the items that right. we, that will also be part of that is also encrypting that traffic. Yeah, we won't from that be point to to us. We won't be sending usernames over the internet. Okay. So, so it, as a more general thing, so we send requests to Umbrella. We're forwarding the private IP. In terms of coming from an edge site where we want to do GeoDNS to a site that means something, that means it needs the request for a public IP needs to come from an address that can resolve to something that's, that has a, a geo lookup that actually goes back to its a reasonable location close to that site. So if I send a request from a more central resolver off to Umbrella, how does that then resolve back? Or, or are we saying that that resolver has to be the one that's local to every single site? In other words, is there any way to have that more centralized and proxying and then is there anything smarter in there to do that or is it every single, every, every edge device is the one sending off to Umbrella and then if not, my edge device is the one that then has to go off and ask the ends the the real do the real query to find out what the real address is for the site in order to get a proper GeoDNS response. Do you see? Uh, I don't know if I'm asking the question in a very so. Word so, I, so I think what you're way. asking is, as an end user, if if you're s somewhere in the world and you send a query and the query yeah. gets then routed to Umbrella, yeah, will you get the local response? Yeah, yeah. So we we, we support the like the geo, so what's happening there is it's actually leveraging the same extension. So when, it, when you make a query for, for instance, we have a data center in Palo Alto. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, sorry, Sao Paulo. Um, yeah. if, you make a, if you make a request from, um, you know, if, you go to, if you're in Chile and you go to google.com, right, that request via Anycast is gonna go to our data center in Brazil. 
but yeah. it's also going to carry on. It's going to send a bit of the IP address that's actually requesting that query. Right. So when we get the query in Palo Alto, in Sao Paulo, we're actually going to send that to the authoritative right. provider saying this request is coming from a user in Chile. So we'll take that, we'll cache that, and give that to the user so they'll get Right. So, so in fact, really, so when, when we send the request to Umbrella, embedded within that is the private IP of the original requester so that we can track that. And then when Umbrella does the, does the recursive request to go and get the actual answer, it can then use the request that came from that edge DNS Resolver exactly right. the public IP to right. embed in the request onward right. onto the real yep. resolver That's in order to get IP. the yep. okay that makes sense thank you um, one of the kind of interesting points that I find talking about DNS right is maybe we'll just start off with a question anyone have any ideas uh, how many DNS queries a user makes per day right just maybe on average anyone in here hundreds maybe thousands. Okay. Yeah. Anyone else? Thousands. Thousands. Okay. Yeah. Actually. Yeah. So it's, we find on average it's between two and three thousand. Now, obviously, that's going to depend on what type of user you are, how how many hours you work, what you're doing, how many devices, etc. But I think it's kind of an interesting statistic. And lots of times, when you actually have these conversations with enterprises, I'll talk to people and say, if someone in your organization goes to Facebook.com, right, or goes to any sort of external domain, do you have any visibility into that? And lots of times, companies aren't, aren't sure. Um, and quite often, what you'll see is, depending on organizations, they may have different types of deployments, right? Um, they may have a location in Europe that's, they just use their ISP to do the DNS. They might have another office in Asia, and the local team out there decided to point to Google, for, um, you know for resolution. They may have some other sorts of appliances. Um, and then if you think about the users, everyone now is on a laptop right now. Um, I imagine you have some sort of you know, protection and stuff. And when you go into your company, lots of times there's firewalls, et cetera. But then what happens when you take your laptop home, right? What happens when you go to one of your customer sites? What happens when you go to a cafe, right? Lots of times you lose some of that security protection that you have on-prem. Um, so this is just kind of an interesting point in terms of the value of a recursive DNS service, right? So that's what we are, a recursive DNS service that provides security at that layer. Um, so there's just lots of value in having a recursive DNS. Lots of times um, you'll have different ISPs, users get different experience when, you know, depending on who their DNS provider may be. Um, so this just gives you a simple way to you know, point to, we have Anycast IP addresses, you point to those Anycast IP addresses, we have over 30 data centers globally, you're guaranteed to get routed to the closest data center to get the fastest response. Um, which also provides a consistent way to do policy enforcement, right, which I'll start talking about and enforce security. Um, really quickly here, this is just a quick slide showing some third party validation. Um, you can go to dnsperf.com, you can select a region, if you click public DNS resolvers in the center, and this just kind of shows some global DNS providers and the query speeds on average. <coughs> what I think is interesting about this is, you know, we're right up there, number two. Um, that's Cloudflare up there, slightly faster. They have more points of presence, um, but we're right there, about 15 milliseconds. Google's about 25 milliseconds. There's some other ones that are slower than that. So I think it's just kind of interesting in terms of when you're again talking to people, do you want that visibility? Yes, you can point to a recursive DNS provider, a global recursive DNS provider, and now get consistent DNS performance. Um, this is just another study from Thousand Eyes with a kind of similar breakdown on, on speeds. But the real takeaway from this is you can point to, you know, you can point to Google, you can point to Cloudflare, and the idea is if someone gets infected with malware and they're reaching out to a command and control server, well, guess what? Those services are going to tell you, here's the IP address that you're requesting, you know, super fast. <laughs> But what they don't provide is they don't provide the ability to do any sort of blocking policies and no visibility, right? So we actually do offer um, a completely free service. It's called DNS monitoring. Um, you can go to dnsmonitoring.umbrella.com. You can sign up 100% free, point your traffic to us, no rate limiting, and we'll now give you some sense about all that DNS traffic. So if you think about those 3,000 queries per user, now you can picture what kind of intelligence that actually provides you about your own organization, right? Hey, maybe this, this location in New York is using Slack. This location in Miami is using, you know, um, is using WebEx Teams. This other, this other location is using something different, right? So it actually gives you a lot of interesting statistics about what the users are doing. And as I was mentioning, it becomes a simple mechanism to enforce security. 
because we have all this traffic coming to us, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a little bit, um, it's such a fundamental protocol, <coughs> DNS. Um, one of the nice things about it, it's actually really easy to point your DNS to us externally, um, and it provides an effective layer of security. Lots of times um, I've worked with customers where they have these bespoke systems that they've created. Maybe it's like healthcare, or hospitals, uh, manufacturing facilities. They have these bespoke devices. You can't put agents on those, right? They run out of date operating systems. They're not proxy aware. Mm. But lots of times those are still leveraging DNS if they, have to, if they have to reach out somewhere. So this becomes an ideal mechanism to actually provide security. Malware, command and control, phishing, etc. This is all public internet, right? So we've got Blue Cat doing my private network. Exactly. All the we, operations, all the functionality, all the capabilities. And now we're just talking about Cisco Umbrella, which is the public DNS, which Blue Cat can chain into as needed. Exactly. exactly. We, we do not want to know any internal domains. We're not going to know how to resolve that. No, that's right? fine. Yeah. I just wanted to set the picture because um, I think sometimes that gets lost when we suddenly start talking about Umbrella. And we've transitioned topics, so I want to cover it. Yeah. So when we were, I think we alluded to this a little bit earlier, but it's, you know, it's quite simple to point your DNS to us. And you know, lots of times it might just be an Active Directory server, or local bind server, and you say, OK, I want to forward those DNS queries to Umbrella. You put in our, Anycast, our two Anycast IPs, and boom, you're going to get faster, faster resolution, and it provides a mechanism to enforce security and content. Um, however, there are different synergies. Obviously, within the Cisco ecosystem, there's some synergies, whether you may you know, be using ISRs, or Viptela wireless LAN controllers. Um, the Meraki one's quite interesting. So Meraki will actually send, um, will encrypt the traffic. It will send the SSID and the private IP address of who's making the query, right? So it kind of gives us additional attribution. You're still getting the same layer, layer of security. Um, we do have integration with Active Directory, et cetera. And of course, there's for off network protection. Right, so again, I was, I was talking about lots of times when users are on-prem, they're being protected by firewalls, proxies, et cetera. So now when the user goes off-network, um, we have integrations with AnyConnect so we can detect when the user is not on a corporate network. And what we'll do is we'll actually encrypt all their DNS traffic and send them to the resolver. So now you get consistent policies for users on and off-network. Um, we also support Chromebooks. We have a standalone <coughs> client for Windows, Macs. And if you do, this is kind of via our partnership with Apple. If you are running supervised, managed iOS devices, you can actually ensure that all your, don't have my phone with me, um, all your DNS queries for your phone, no matter what network they're on, 2G, 3G, 4G, 5G, that those queries are going to our resolver and you also have those policies. Now that, that's again only for supervised and managed iOS devices from a privacy. Is that all still DNS? Over UDP, like legacy DNS, legendary DNS. It, it's still DNS. So not DOH. <laughs> no. Right. Well, I'm, I'm not a storage guy, but um. <laughs> oh, you are. You are. That was funny. So <laughs> the the data you actually capture is kind of dangerous, right? You capture a whole lot of you know whatever website, whatever DNS calls people are doing. So besides the security aspect of using that data, what else do you do with that data? I uh, don't think there's anything. We don't we don't use it for any other purposes. Um, what, sure we have some privacy legal statement that says is there, well, more. What do you do with the data um, then? Is the, it? The, I mean, yeah. well, so that you have the data available for for you to look at as a as a customer, right? Well, but do you delete it after an hour? Do you save it at all? You know, what what's the yeah? So we, we, we have some options. Part of it. You, you can. I'll show you in the demo. There's actually some options that you can set yourself in terms of what's actually logged. Mm -hmm. So some cases you may choose not to log it, and it, it won't and, be logged. And I, I would. I mean, I would just say. And I, I don't, I don't care. I, I, I'm as concerned about privacy as anyone. It's one of the reasons why I'm, I'm actually not a Doe or Dot fan. I think, I think they're not actually real privacy because we're just transmitting uh, who we're sending queries to to some other group that's going to then sell it down the road. But you know what I've seen Cisco use it for in the demos they presented, presented to us is really for uh, doing more security studying. And let's remember that we're deploying this on an enterprise, right? I mean, you're, you're, when you work for an organization, they're trying to protect themselves. And this is a really good way, to, like I said, you stop a DNS query from happening, you're not doing any of the follow-on transactions. You're not going to download the malware. You're not going to go to the phishing site. You know? So there's a lot of benefit in doing it at this layer. And you know, again, to your, I, I definitely understand the concern for privacy. One of the nice things about the Blue Cat integration is our ability to keep your on-premises DNS on-premises. But when when you go to the to the public internet, you want that protection, I think. So I, I 
Let me follow that again. What is your stance on DNS over HTTPS? Because, like, I said, like, first you said you didn't, but then you said you want that privacy. So, what is the? I don't like DNS over HTTPS at Period. all. At all. Full no, stop. No, no. I think it's. I think it is a uh, bad solution, and I think it's being misrepresented. To <coughs> Sorry, we're like way off topic, but no, I'm no, no. This is very interesting because I think, but, it's, but I think it's being misrepresented it. to the average consumer as a privacy for them, when in fact all you're doing is transmitting who you're trusting today, which is your ISP, which no one should trust to some other entity, maybe it's, you know, and, and again, there's different organizations, which I don't want to yeah, call them out. Yeah, whoever's got the DNS server gets the data. <coughs> exactly. I want you to get yeah. that data, I want you to support it. <coughs> exactly, exactly. But that's so. different, that's that's an implementation detail, not a... I, that's, that's fair. No, let's go back to... Yeah, yeah. sorry. Um, but, but the kind of takeaway from this is, you know, we worked in a bunch of different <coughs> complex environments, um, done various sorts of deployments. There's one, you know, we can deploy in these different environments. Um, now, specifically with the BlueCat integration, right, we were, just, we were just talking about, this is some actual screenshots of how that integration Ooh. works. So one of the things that they're leveraging is our network device API, right? So typically with Umbrella, what you do is you point your traffic to us and you register your egress IP address. Well, what they're actually doing is they're generating an API key, pasting it in their UI, and then that traffic from the BlueCat appliance uh, service point is gonna be sent to us. And you can actually see here some registered appliances here, and then this is the real value of what you get down here, the additional attribution, right? So you can see here the external IP of where these queries are coming from, but what's more interesting here is the internal IP address, and that's the real interesting bit of information. If everyone in this room right now, and we were like, oh, someone's infected with some sort of malware, we see it's coming from this room, that's really not gonna help me. I wanna know who exactly in the room, right? I'm gonna need some additional bit of information. And so that's where, that's the kind of crucial bit of information there, that internal IP address. Um, so how we're kind of built into the foundation of the internet, the idea is we see a bunch of traffic, um, over 200 billion queries every day, and we're trying to make sense of it. So when we see those queries coming at, it, at us, where the idea is we can quickly determine, is it good, is it bad? But we've actually, over the years, built out a bit more than that. So we actually have, we've built in what's called an intelligent proxy. So we do have the capability for our users where if a site, if, if we're unsure of a site or if it's a newly seen domain, that is, we see about three million newly seen domains every day. That's a domain we've never seen before. What we can do is we can actually proxy the traffic to that domain through our, through our proxy, where we can do virus scanning, um, check files downloaded against our AMP database, et cetera, to determine if it could be, if the traffic could be malicious. So the idea is to really provide this security capability for users, whether they're on or off the, or off the network. Now, about, the, about some of the information that we see, this is, um, this is more like my, my, favorite, my favorite stuff um, because since, since I was working here, I always got interested in terms of how do exactly did we determine if something's bad, right? Um, so what we do is we see around 200 billion queries every day. And what's quite unique about that is I'd say the scale, but not only the scale of that data, but the diversity of the data. If you think of a user when they're on a company network with firewalls and proxies, they're probably gonna go to more corporate, corporate -y sites, right? Um, but what actually happens is it's when users go off network, when they're on a public Wi-Fi, when they're at home, that's where they go to the kind of more dangerous parts of the internet. Um, we typically see that with um, gambling traffic, um, with like gambling, adult sites, um, streaming media sites, right? Someone wants to watch the latest Game of Thrones episode or a football game in another country, et cetera. So they start Googling and they're taken to these, you know, dodgy infrastructure where those sites are streamed. What happens is they get infected when they're off the network and then they go bring their laptop back on the corporate network and things kind of spread. Um, so what's unique about this is over 100 million daily active users, but again, that traffic is coming from over 18,000 um, 18, enterprise customers, but also all the free users, right? So we have free services at home. You can you know, block adult content completely free by pointing your DNS to us at home. Um, we have a large, diverse base uh, with users in over 190 countries. What do we actually see at that? What kind of intelligence are we able to gather at this level? Um, we're able to, if you think about it, we're seeing those external queries, right? So that we're seeing those queries, maybe they're sent from the, you know, from the Blue Cat appliance. What information can we see about who's making that query, right? We're gonna see things like, if this is a domain we've never seen before, we can say, ah, that's a, that's a brand new domain on the internet. Let's say that we see, uh, you know, if it's a phishing, if it's a phishing domain, we can infer, hey, this user you know, may have clicked a link on a phishing domain. 
or you know, command and control callbacks could be indications of compromised systems, right? Why all of a sudden is we see someone reaching out to looks like a completely randomly generated domain name, we can infer, hey, that looks like a command and control request, right? So that's kind of the intelligence that we see of who's making those queries, right? What countries are the users coming from, et cetera. But now, at the end of the day, we're a recursive provider, which means we actually, at first, don't know the IP address. So we have to go to the authoritative source to actually find out what that IP address is. Now, this actually gives us a completely different view of what's happening to the backend infrastructure, right? So let's say you know, you're querying your bank.com and we always see this IP address, all of a sudden it goes to a completely different IP address, right? We're able to kind of see that, we're able to kind of see that change. Um, we're able to say things like, see things like fast flux domains, right? It's a domain <coughs> constantly changing from one IP address to another IP address. Um, we're able to kind of see the newly spun up infrastructure, right? So we know where things are, we know where there's like bulletproof hosting providers out there, et cetera. So we have these kind of two views of the internet. We have who's making all these queries, what types of queries they're making, how many queries they're making, and then we're kind of like mapping out the infrastructure on the back end. <laughs> so we know where these domains are, which IPs they've been at, how long they've been there, what's the who is information, all this other information. So that's just kind of setting the stage for the amount of information that we have. And then if you talk about what we actually do with this information, um, this is actually where it gets, this is where it gets really interesting. So we actually have a team, this is where we kind of tie into Talos. Um, we have a team of you know, research, um, research people with PhDs, like literally studying this information, coming in 200 billion queries a day, trying to identify patterns, right? How can we identify trends of this? What could make this malicious? And how can we actually identify this at, at scale, right? And even leveraging things like, um, like artificial intelligence and stuff to identify some of these some of these domains. Now, in addition to that, we have a whole team of analysts, and I look at that as more of the the people in the loop, right? So they're actually they're hooked into the security community. Um, they're looking at things like false positive reports, etc. And so they're there as well, kind of, and the two kind of keep each other in check. Um, and this this is, I think, one of the biggest differentiators is our actual threat intel, right? Because lots of people can provide. You know, say you're providing security at, at the DNS layer, but they don't have the 200 billion queries a day with the broad diversity of the global traffic that we're seeing to actually, to actually make some of these decisions. Um, so some of the things we can do is we actually have like these algorithms, there's, there's dozens of these to do things like DGA prediction, right? Looking at the likelihood of a domain if it was domain generated algorithm. Um, Punicode, if you're, if you're familiar with that, right? That's where you have uh, foreign characters <coughs> that are made to look like real characters for, from a phishing perspective, right? Being able to look at these domains and say, hey, this looks like it could be phishing or not. So there's basically heaps of these that are constantly running um, on a regular basis and we're constantly convicting all these different domains. And the best thing about this is, you know, we're, we're seeing over third, three million newly seen domains every day. Um, we're identifying over 60,000 malicious destinations every day. And at any point, we're blocking more than 7 million malicious destinations. And you get that protection just by pointing your DNS to us. So when you're talking from like an architectural, architecturally, this is important because all you have to do to benefit from this security is, you know, maybe it's point your proxies to us, point your firewalls to us, point, point the DNS for that to us, and you get that, that layer of security. Um, if I was to ask if you have, you know, if you have a firewall and I say, okay, I have 60,000 destinations I want to block, and I give those to you every day, eventually, you know, you're not gonna be able to take those at scale. And as I mentioned, as we're evolving, we, we started off as a, you know, recursive DNS company, OpenDNS, if you're familiar with that. Um, and what we've done is we've kind of grown, we've added the DNS layer of security, we've brought in that correlated threat intel, um, we've actually made like an acquisition in the CASB space, and what we're doing is building out a secure internet gateway. So what we've recently also launched is a secure web gateway, where now instead of just doing the DNS queries, we can actually route all the traffic. So we'll see the full URLs that people are going to, not just the domains, and also a cloud-delivered firewall. So the idea is that the vision here is to kind of protect all the users for all the applications that they're accessing, whether it be on or off network, to provide these, these capabilities. And now I'll jump into a quick demo. Save this. Super condition. Oh, 
<clears throat> Should just have to, I think we have to refresh this one too, just to get it to, it should come up in a second. So th this, this, is, this is the user interface for Umbrella, um, you know, completely web-based, located in the cloud. And how I typically start it is, you know, how easy it is to get up and running. So you have various deployments that we talked about, right? So when I go to this deployments tab over here, this shows me the different deployment options. So depending on your organization, it may be you've just pointed your traffic to us and you registered that egress IP. Um, you can download the roaming client, which will give you the attribution to a computer. Um, we have the Chromebook support. What I'm going to show here is the network device. So this is where Blue Cat's actually read, is actually using our network device API. So what they've done is you've generated an API key here, paste it in Blue Cat, and now that device is effectively registered with us. It's going to send all those external queries, queries to us and also pass along the additional attribution. So great, we have our traffic coming to us. And then what do you actually do with the traffic? <laughs> you control that traffic with a policy. So this is where you can create different policies. What will happen is the policy at the top, the first policies that matched is the one that will be applied. So if we just take a look at a policy here, we have a blue cat policy. What you do with a policy is you select a set of identities to apply to that policy. So of course, depending on your deployment, that might be an Active Directory group. It might be Active Directory users. It could be, you know, it could be iPhones. Um, it could be the roaming computers. It could be an entire network. What we have here is the network devices. So these, this is actually saying, I'm going to set this policy for these blue cat service points. Now we break the blocking into two categories. We have our security, and then we have content. So from a security perspective, um, the kind of most common categories that we have here are malware, command and control, and phishing. We also have categories for the newly seen domains. Right? So I have this conversation. I think it's interesting. We see 3 million newly seen domains every day. Um, if you're running a manufacturing facility or you know, some health some system in a hospital, is there really a legitimate need for it to access a domain that's new within the last 24 hours? Probably not. Um, if you block your developers from going to this, they will absolutely hate you because everything they spin up in public cloud is always unique subdomains, unique instances. So you're talking you about don't. an authoritative domain, not a subdomain. Uh, well, it applies to subdomains too. Okay. Yeah. So lots, lots of times AWS will be, you know, Amazon AWS or something with a bunch of unique stuff in front of it. Right. Okay. So it is a problem in that sort of environment. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. You do not want to block the developers, and you, you can whitelist domains as well. Um, we also have these, you know, DNS tunneling. So we talked a little bit how you can you can identify tunneling <laughs> east-west. We can do some of that tunneling identification as well. And then crypto mining. That's that's kind of an easy one as well, right? If you have a data center, probably shouldn't have crypto mining going on in there unless oh. you're a certain type of company. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you do. Right. Because <laughs> they does exist. They you mean wonderful. all of the blockchain oh, oh, companies. For sure. But yeah, I, yeah. I'd say the large majority yeah, of companies. Absolutely. And every time I've worked with a customer where we have found crypto mining, it was 100% not approved and yeah. it led to other things going on. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> um, now, from a content perspective, it also becomes an easy mechanism to you know, restrict content. So we have these three out-of-the-box levels, high, medium, low, or custom, and you can completely you know, protect what, what you want to block here, right? This is pretty popular in like guest Wi-Fi instances, et cetera. So you can choose, there's over 80 categories um, ranging from German youth protection to pornography to terrorism, social networking, file sharing, et cetera. So those are the content. And then you have these destination lists. So you can always, of course, override these and say, this is a allow list, this is a deny list. I want these domains in here. <coughs> and you can completely customize the block page, right? What's the experience that the user is going to see when they try to go to this page? And lastly, we were talking about the logging a little bit here. You actually have control of what, what information is being logged here, right? So you can say, I want to log all requests, or only want to log security events, or I don't want to log anything at all. And we also provide the option to, when we're logging this information, we can store it in an S3 bucket so that you can then bring it into a SIM or any additional analytics that you might want to do with it. So that, that's what a policy looks like. And then lastly, we have the reporting, right? What can you do with this information? So I think this is, you know, I kind of started off with just top categories, right? So if you think of those 3,000 DNS queries, you can just start with something as, you know, what are the top categories of sites? And then I can drill down on this to see which side is accessing this sorts of content, right? Or which, which specific user here. But we also have things like, you know, the security overview where we can drill down to see 
okay, what are the types of requests that are being blocked by destination, by identity, who's actually blocking these bad sites? Um, all these reports can be automatically saved and custom and emailed on a you know, daily, weekly basis. We're, I'd say we're pretty, pretty flexible there with like role-based access control and reporting. Um, but one of the things I wanted to end on, a, on an end note is the kind of, uh, when we're talking about the thread intel, we, I mentioned the 200 billion queries we see every day. We actually provide a, a system called Investigate, um, which you can actually kind of mine some of that information. You'll see it's very anonymized. But one of the things I like to do here is I can search, um, to give you an idea how live some of this information is, I just did a search here for paypal.com wildcarding it for the last seven days or saying, show me all the domains that are matching paypal.com. Right? <laughs> and what's interesting about this is, and, and this comes from the amount of traffic we're getting. So if you look at this guy right here, right, this domain is paypal.com. Sorry, I tried to blow it up for you. Let me go. Yeah, paypal.com.cgi-bin-source-update-account-center, top-notch-manpower.co.cc or something, right? So we actually, the only reason this domain is here is because we actually saw that query hit our resolver, right? Now, could it, and that's because of, again, the diversity of the traffic. It could be someone in an airport lounge, a coffee shop, a university, an enterprise customer, a free user at home, et cetera. And we've actually, we saw that query hit our resolvers. Um, today's the 14th, right? Yeah, this is um, GMT. So we saw that query hit earlier, a little bit earlier today. Someone actually made that query. We've already categorized it as malware, right? And so you get that protection. So if you think if you have a user, that has some email or they're on a phone, et cetera, that's, that's meant to look like you know, paypal.com and with a shorter address bar in your screen, it's gonna look a little more fishy, but you're getting that protection just by, by pointing those from a DNS perspective. Um, and to, like another example, I'll do a very last thing just to kind of show the magnitude of the information. Um, if I look up something like google.com, um, you can see some of the information that we have, that we have available. Um, including the amount of traffic that we're seeing. So in the last, in the last hour, we actually saw uh, 516 million queries hit our data, hit our resolvers for google.com, right? So we can actually see the kind of Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday with lulls on the weekend. And there is uh, heaps of information here that you can use um, that tell you additional information about, about this, where the users are coming from, et cetera, IP addresses, ASNs, all this is also available via um, via API to do integration with other systems. Cool. So how do you license the umbrella? So umbrella is licensed, great question. Umbrella is typically licensed per user. So it doesn't matter how many devices the user has, lots of times it's it's like how many users in your active directory from a yeah. kind of okay. really simple case. Yeah. And BlueCat, how do you license that? Uh, we also license it per IP address. IP address, okay. Mm -hmm. What happens so when you get a classification wrong? Yeah, so what a, lot, lots of times when we get a classification wrong, we have a lot of over 18,000 customers, right? Chances are someone else is, is finding out about it as well. So there's two things. I mean, you can either like open a ticket really quick or um, what you can do if you're 100% sure is you can just whitelist that domain yourself, right? If you're like, I really want people to go here, that's those allow and block lists. You can, those will override everything else.